presenter is uh, Dr. Naoki Sakai of uh, National Research Institute for Earth Science and Disaster Resilience. Um, so um, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sakai uh, to give his presentation. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your chairman. And uh, today uh, I am uh, happy to uh, talk about this you know, because in uh, 2020, I uh, come to Malaysia in here about two or three years ago. And now I want to talk about this in the face to face, in that very happy. And in the title is a uh, front line on the disaster response over a broad area using the satellite constellation. And now in the next, okay. Now I am a, uh, uh, I will give a lecture for uh, UTM. Now, now this uh, title is um, Geohazard Information for a Disaster Risk Assessment for this. Then now, sometimes I have my, I have come to Malaysia in the, for one week, I will give a take, uh, lecture for this. Then now in the 2011 and uh, 2016, uh, I joined the Satraps project in uh, Malaysia in a uh, in a uh, landslide in a uh, GIS in a uh, flood in uh, so to mitigate the um, issues in Malaysia. Then now in the five years project. Okay. Then now this is our institute for this. Uh, okay, no time. Then now. Uh, I have I, I am talk about this in the disaster response based on a promptly and a wide area damage assessment. It is very important things uh, quickly in the disaster response. Now, now this is a you can see the Sentinel One and the Planet Dog in the Eros Two in Japanese. In the this satellite image, in the we are pushed on that in the Sony in camera is a directly push. Then now we can see the image just now. But in the satellite image is uh, about uh, six hours and so on. It's a very, very so much time to get the product and so on. So it is a very, uh, very, very issue for this in the using satellite data. Then now uh, this is a process is uh, here. Then now, uh, triggering in the FOIA and the when is a danger area is here, the triggering. In the selecting is a which kind of satellite image, such as planet, arrows, uh, we can select. The, now this system is a one-stop system. In the, this is a Japanese and a, a national project. The, now we can make the one-stop system. The, now, we can get the data in the, we can analyze and uh, for uh, this making a product. Uh, this is a example for this uh, to uh, 2021 in the uh, debris flow in July in Malaysia. Then now this is a satellite data is here. This is planet. Then now we can only image we can analyze the debris flow here in the uh, slope failure we can see. Now, now this is a product for Savo area in the sediment uh, catchment area is a slope failure, which kind of in the, we can uh, count it. Then now this is a very important things. Then now this image is uh, for local resilience. Uh, now important to monitor the sediment movement situation and uh, for uh, this is this uh, like a product this is a more to monitor this is very important things okay then now we can this uh, sip is a japanese national program then now for this is a uh, uh, aiming to provide in the product immediately after disaster. This is a, a satellite image uh, using process is here. This is a, a before project and a disaster happened. 
that now information is so much information, but this is a correct or not correct. This is very difficult to identify. Now, now this is a we can go request for JAXA. That now selecting is the Eros2 image, but in the about the six hours and so on. So many times we can uh, we can have uh, data. Now, now this is the um, product. That so many times. Now, now this is a uh, uh, before. A pro, uh, project. Now, now this our uh, this system in the working now. Now, now triggering is uh, it is very important. Triggering means in the uh, flooding simulation and so on. And the heavy rainfall area is where in the weather information we can get data. Now, now this. When in the where uh, disaster happened to simulate this. Then now this is the trigger now. Then now this is a disaster happened. Then now can so many short time, uh, like uh, in this case, either two hours, we can get the data and uh, like a product. Uh, this is very important things. Then now development of a one stop system. Now, this is a one stop system content. Now, now, this system is a so many satellite. Now, now uh, ordinary, we can use EROS 2 in the by JAXA in Japanese uh, 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 Institute. Now, now, other is a commercial satellite, small satellite, in the so many, many much uh, working now. Then now this is a, we can use this. Then other is a, an international disaster charter. Uh, this is a very important in the working program. Then now in the we can uh, manage the JAXA and the small satellite for this in the, our system. Then now this is a users, uh, national government and the local government in the disaster headquarters uh, this is a system structure is for this is very complex now, now this is a one stop system with a this and triggering information here uh, made by an IED. And uh, this is a system with a by Fujitsu system. Then now we can uh, select information in the JAXA in the system. The other is a satellite data platform. We can make the NYED. This one stop system is here. Then now, and now we have to talk about the use of one stop system. Step one, uh, this is a triggering, selecting, in the analysis product, uh, this is a three-step process. Then now here is a triggering in the predicted to data in the flood simulation uh, like this, and the other disaster information, weather and uh, and uh, alert data and the river data we can we can get. Then now this is a satellite observer area. Uh, this is a Eros two. Uh, here is a uh, we can. Selected area that now here so many, but either we can get that there is a one one image is a here that now this is very small area is here that now we can select it by and uh, all area uh, from the one image. In the weather and the river information, now, now here we can get that. Yeah, uh, this system is a and the sample is here. Now, now and uh, so on. This is a rainfall, a real time rainfall data. And the other is an earthquake in the seismic intensity. And uh, 
this is an uh, estimated and uh, perhaps building in the earthquake. Now, now in the NYD, the flooding, landslide, and uh, uh, the earthquake is here. And uh, in the, with the information in the meteorology agency, we can get the data. In the, this is uh, uh, information we can get. Okay, this is a satellite observable area is here. The, now this is a, this image is here. The, now we can get the, in the uh, time uh, indicator is we can move this. The, now this is a, in this time is here, other time is here and uh, we can get the data. We can know the uh, situation for satellite. Uh, this is the other, is, uh, other satellite is here. So many satellites is here coming, okay? It is very important things. That so many satellites is an observable area is uh, we can know uh, this. The, now this is a, uh, and the selecting in the satellite data, we can get the where in the when, in the, this is a danger area. In the, this is a observable area, the ROS2 here. Now, now in the wide, it are 60 kilometer in here. Now, now this is a uh, left and right. This is a, and a satellite orbit. Now, now we can select it where this is. Now, now in this case is a here in the three sections. Now, now this is very small. Now, now it is important to uh, gathering the and uh, weather information and the hazard information. Now, now this is a triggering selecting. This area is a selecting. The selecting with uh, so many observable area is that now we can get the uh, data uh, by here. Now, now we are requesting in the this. Uh, Request observation and the after uh, confirming the existence of a past image is here. The now this is a selecting in the area is a we are and uh, selected is here. The now we are requesting on the JAXA for this. In the one stop system is uh, included for this. The now this is an um, analysis product in the here. The now sa image analyze data is here. Now, now this is an, in the SAR image, is, it is very important to identify it in the flooding area is here. Uh, this is blue is a uh, flooding area, estimated flooding area. And uh, because radar and uh, laser radar is a, uh, it is very useful to uh, water surface to identify. It is very important things here. Now, now this is an optical image. In the satellite data is a star image in the optical and the two type. Now, now this is a optical, it, it is very uh, useful to, and, uh, to know the situation for the hazard area. Now, now this area is an analysis in the product for this. And uh, this is a development of a demo system for a uh, foreign country. In system is a, uh, we can work with the, and uh, in Japan only, but is a, this is a satellite is a whole and uh, us. Then now we can get the data is a, another uh, foreign country for this, okay? Uh, for example, uh, this is a rain viewer uh, for this in the, for example, now, now this is the, and uh, this area is um, Malaysia in the, in the east, uh, south Asia. Now, now this is the info, in the heavy rainfall area is of where we can know this. In the earthquake, is, uh, we can get the USGS and site is here. 
uh, this is the East Malaysia and so on. Uh, 2050 in the big earthquake is here. So now in the, we can get the earthquake is here. So now in this case is a observation plan is a, in this uh, Malaysia is here. Now, now this uh, line is a, can get the data is satellite image. The now so many the satellite data is we can get the now in the check the uh, satellite uh, information uh, we can get the, in this case is uh, here in the uh, invalidation near site in the another site in the other in the other data, data for in the satellite information for this. In the another is here and the observation plan. Okay, in this summary is here. Uh, once the system in the we can prototype with the development. In the today, I talk about this is a uh, for this here. In the users can graphs is the when and where the danger is in the when the where the satellite can observe. This is very important things. This is very so and a new system is here in the world. Now, now other is here. And today we talk about uh, one thing, demo system for 14 countries. And 40 countries mean in this case is Malaysia. Now, now and uh, if it's interested in this kind of a uh, concept and system. Then now we can do uh, research together using this system as a Sankanga Kurenke in the private company and the uh, university and the uh, institute. Then now this system is a uh, triggering and uh, selecting. This is one of system is uh, including for seamless system. It is a very, very uh, new system is here. Then now this is the analysis and the product. Uh, this is uh, in the after that in the uh, talk about the uh, Nippon Koe for this. Then now this is a uh, seamless for this in the system. Then now in the disaster happened in the product using the now in the whole Malaysia uh, style. This is very local resilience. This is very important things. Then now in the we can work together, but we can work for together all this. Okay. Okay. Then now in addition to in the this is a, a urban water logging mitigation based on the concept of spongy and uh, C and uh, Sakai and the uh, in the paper for this. Then now uh, tomorrow morning the session. Uh, we can do this. Uh, this is an adaptation in the uh, strategy is used to reduce the future damage. In the, this is a satellite system using four urban water logging mitigation. This is very, very important things. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sakai, for your insightful presentation and the, uh, I think uh, some of the activities that you're doing with this SIP project uh, funded by um, Ministry of Education and Science and Technology of Japan uh, is uh, very interesting. Uh, and I hope that uh, you could uh, apply your experiences from that project uh, to Malaysia um so uh, we are we'll proceed to our next uh, presenter uh, our next presenter is a uh, professor abdul rashid bin mohammed sharif uh, he is the president uh, of the institution of geospatial and remote sensing malaysia or igrsm uh, who will present on the malaysian uh, aspect or uh, uh, malaysian experience of uh, re using remote sensing uh, i think uh, including satellite uh, technology so Professor, please. Thank you, 
suggesting that. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for having me here today. And uh, thank you for joining the, <laughs> the event. Uh, I'm going to talk about the application for remote sensing for disaster reduction in Malaysia. Uh, I didn't know the composition of the audience, so I have included some basic elements for Malaysia for the benefit of our international guests. Uh, and uh, I represent uh, IGRSM, Institution of Geospatial Remote Sensing Malaysia. For those of you who are not members, you are welcome to apply if you are in the, the geospatial area. We encompass the broad areas of geospatial. And uh, this includes also including the engineers and the non-engineers who are into geospatial. And we also uh, welcome the international participants in this area. We have associate membership. I'm also uh, a lecturer at the uh, University of Putra, Malaysia. Okay, uh, so for the disaster reduction, is, uh, which is aimed at preventing new and reducing existing disaster risk and managing uh, residual risks, all of which contribute to strengthening resilience and therefore the achievement of sustainable development. Bear in mind, we cannot stop development. It's going to happen, yeah? But we have to emphasize on the sustainability. Not all development is sustainable as you can see what's happening around you. I hope those uh, engineers and those in charge of approving development take note of this. I have seen myself, you know, condominiums built on mountains, on hills. And this is why I asked the last speaker from IHI, the beautiful hills he showed just now with no development. I find that uh, it's wonderful aspiration to aim for. And the strategies and policies define the goals and objectives across different time scales with concrete targets, indicators, and time frames. Bear in mind, we don't inherit the earth for our generation. We owe it for the generation to come. This is meant by the time scales. Oftentimes, we are embedded in our own time. We forget what we are going to give our children and grandchildren and what we inherited from our forefathers. So in line with the Sendai framework for disaster reduction, which is meant to go until 2013, we should aim at preventing the creation of disaster risk, the reduction of existing risks, and to strengthen the economic, social, health, and environmental resilience. This is the expectation of societies. This is the agreement our governments have made internationally. Now, as citizens of the world, do we have a right to question our government if our society is not following the Sendai framework? I ask you to think about it as we go along this presentation. Now, at the global agreed policy of disaster risk reduction in the United Nations endorsed Sendai framework adopted in March 2015, expected over the 15 years, the substantial reduction of disaster risks and losses in lives, livelihoods, health, economic, physical, social, cultural, and environmental assets. But what we have heard from the last few presenters, are these figures going down or up? Do you know it yourself? Are we respecting the framework which our governments have committed to? And who is standing up to question this? If not for you guys here, the educated and the elite of the, uh, the knowledgeable people, who, who will raise this question? Do we just make an agreement in the United Nations, nice on paper, and we close our eyes as though nothing happens? Now, in Malaysia, to support the, the resilience of geospatial, uh, we have a geospatial agency in National Survey and Mapping Department, JUPAM. I worked for them for 17 years, so I understand them a bit well. They have vector data mostly. And we have also have the National Space Agency called MISA, Malaysian Space Agency. They, uh, they will give us mostly the raster data. We don't have our own satellites. We hope to get it, uh, get it up soon. And uh, they have some arrangements to get those uh, raster images. And we also have the National Geospatial Center, Pusat Geospatial Negara. And they don't produce much spatial data, but they facilitate the sharing of the geospatial data, which is very important. 
and I give you some examples from Malaysia. I took this from uh, DID, yeah, from your website. So if I say something incorrect, please correct me. So here is uh, of the areas of the country which are flood prone in Peninsular Malaysia. As you can see, the coastal areas of uh, the east uh, east coast here, they they are very prone to the flooding here, and also the inhabited areas also very prone to flooding. Eh? And also in the center here on the Pahang area. And uh, these are also uh, populated parts of the peninsula. And maybe in the case of uh, Sabah and Sarawak, relatively, relatively may look a bit lesser. Also, here is quite uh, marked as well. And now, in the case of uh, DID, uh, they, they have also produced one important product. In fact, they produce many important products, but one of the important products related to the talk today is a flood hazard map, which is used for the risk evaluation, which is used for reducing flood losses, and it's also a basic step for flood barriers. Uh, I looked through their websites, and also I have been to their offices as well. Uh, the use of remote sensing is not so prominent. It is there, you know, but uh, not as well as, uh, I think, like uh, Sakai Sensei mentioned just now. If we have a method of monitoring in real time, because we don't have our own satellite, so we are, we are dependent on other people's satellite. And also we don't have that operational uh, procedure embedded into our systems, probably because we don't have our own facilities. So <clears throat> I will explain to you later what the arrangement that we have. And here an example of the flood hazard map. Huh? They have given here for Sungai Bulo. And uh, you can see the intensity of the color here. Oh, where it is, yeah? uh, the, the, the darker intensity goes to the higher amount of water, uh, higher <coughs> depths, I think 0 0.8 or 1.2, something like that. Eh? And this is the lower one, the lighter blue one. And for this type of hazard map, uh, you can use the satellite image. For example, if you can get a clear, clear image, mind you, if you're doing an optical satellite and it is uh, raining dogs and cats, you're not going to get any image which you can use. Of course, you use radar, you can get it. And not always you get the radar satellite going over exact time that you are expecting it as well. <clears throat> so this again comes back to the issue of constellation. We look forward to that. Many parties have come to us and uh, we are always hoping that, uh, you know, can work with MISA or work with uh, Malaysian parties to create this constellation, which is so critical for our requirement. And so these are other examples for Sungai Damansara and also in Sungai Selangor. And I'll give you the next example is on the land movements and also landslides. Now, this is the case of Highland Tower. It collapsed in 1993. It's a 12 story high building. Eh? And it's a very strong building. You can see, as it collapsed, it is still strong. It didn't break it up. People were trapped inside there. And uh, I think after 10 years, 48 people died in there. I put it here for the benefit. Uh, not, not just to inform the international uh, crowd, but also to refresh the memories of locals who have forgotten about it. I said they have forgotten about it because I see more and more hillside development being approved. They forgot how the, the three, uh, three days of consecutive rain in a tropical country can bring a tower down, a very strong concrete tower. And mind you, the elite stayed there. Not any and Tom, Dick, and Harry, you know, not Achong, Ahmad, or Ali. Very rich people stayed there. They stayed in such strong building. It just came down simply because of the rain. You can see this is a one. This is Tower One that came down, and Tower Two is still and Three is still standing. Eh? So it is located uh, in Taman Hillview, Ulu Klang. I don't know whether you're going to visit tomorrow. Maybe you can go to this place. They were built on Terrace Hill between 75 and 78. Apartments were home to locals and expatriates. After 10 days, I'm sorry, not 10 days, 10 days of torrential rain, Block 1 collapsed, burying the building's occupants, burying the building occupants under tons of deb debris. We had 500 rescue workers from Singapore, Japan, France, UK, US, who worked around the clock in a desperate race trying to save the people down there despite safety concerns over the stability of the two other towers. That was the risk that was taken. So this is a good reminder to those of you who forget and the, also the importance of not to develop the sensitive areas. 
And now, we have a developing issue right, going on right now. This issue of Bukit Dindings in KL. This is Bukit Dindings. It is situated about five kilometers from where this incident happened. Just five kilometers. And authorities are approved it for development. And now, to put up 26 stories high building, condominiums. Can you imagine that? And the soil type is a clay, sandy clay. For those with the geology, you understand how serious this is. And here's an example. Uh, this is the example of 2001. This is at the foothills of Bukit Dinding. In 2001, the slope collapsed and it hit these houses already here at the foothills. And now, up the, up the slope, further development is being approved. You go down here. This is the house of one of the occupants. He was so kind to what's up to me. This is his house in 2001. The flood and the, and the mud and everything came in. He's lucky he saved the baby as well. And this is another case of the same bucket ending, water coming down. Look at that. All of the earth work that needs to be done because the water flowed down in large amounts from these hills over here. All is back is hills. And this is currently, I took this picture myself. You can see the slope failing, falling down. All the trees are coming down as well. Now, this is the resident uh, people. Uh, this is the one of the res residents association president. He made even a police report. But where does it go? Where does it go? And anyway, for those of you who want to support this project or help out, let me know. They, they are asking for professionals to support them because they are just residents. Now I give you another example from Malaysia. It's on the Maisa. This is uh, for headquarters for completeness. Um, they have set up a forest fire information system, uh, mostly using the MODIS and uh, NOAA data. Okay, and uh, this one uh, we had a very bad haze in 1997 when the fires in Indonesia caused uh, a lot of uh, fog and you know uh, mist in Malaysia. So we had to detect the forest fires in Malaysia and ASEAN countries. This forest fire information system was set up by the director of the cabinet. And then, uh, so for the forest fire, MISA, Malaysian Space Agency, mandated by the National Security Council at that time to channel uh, the hotspot and forest fire information to the user agencies in the National Security Council. And they were working with the Department of uh, Environment, Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment. So the, it's an online system, huh? and uh, this system can be assessed directly by related agencies operated since 2011. Huh? And agencies such as uh, Department of Environment, Department of Fire and Rescue, Malaysia, Forestry Department, and Malaysian Civil Dep Defense Department are in the loop. I, I highlight to you here just to show you some of the cooperation and the uh, interagency work that's going on. So they have relatively done a good job over that over the years. And uh, what is the role of Malaysian Space Agency? So one of the, the functions of this technical arm uh, to supply all sets of satellite images to NDCC, to, to the NDCC. NDCC is the natural, uh, natural Disaster Command Center under NATMA, our, our agency entrusted for disaster management, which is under Prime Minister Department. So MISA plays an important role of supplying the images. Where do they get the images from? Maybe if Sakai, San, uh, Sakai Sensei and other colleagues supply to them, they have agreement. Eh? Images obtained from radar sets, spot leads, uh, worldwide, world view, radar from, from Germany extra. So, so this is an important arrangement which they have done. Eh? And uh, we have a special arrangement for drones, eh? special payload, optical and radar, especially for targeted tasks. These are ongoing under the ministry. So the increasing use of drones. Eh? Now, uh, our Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovation, MOSTI, this is preparing 200 drones to be sent to flood hotspot to support and help rescue work by disaster management. It will be extended to flood victims as soon as possible. So this is one of the steps being taken on. Drones becoming much more useful, especially in our situation when we lack satellite images, and also because you want to target it quickly. Uh, satellites come and go, and then maybe they give you the data the next day or next two days after that, eh? maybe too late, but you want it quickly. So one of the initiatives being set up by Mosti here. And uh, there are companies selected eh, 
based on the availability of the drone pilots and equipment. And they'll be trained to provide surveillance, monitoring, and delivery services. We had terrible experience at the end of last year. People are stuck in their houses on top of their roof. They are hungry. So the delivery of food eh, is also important. So unlike satellites, eh, uh, drones can deliver food. So mostly has held uh, initial discussions with the rescue and enforcement agencies. And including the Civil Aviation Authority Malaysia, Department of Survey and Mapping, the Fire and Rescue Department, and Royal Malaysian Air Force. So I hope they can come to some good, uh, sensible relationship on how to have a larger number of ground support of drones. And then uh, the, at the end of last year, a 20 such task force were deployed to several uh, locations in Selangor to monitor. Selangor is a state in Malaysia, just outside Kuala Lumpur, and to develop basic supply, medicine, food, and power banks especially in areas that were difficult. Power banks are important. In 2014, we had people stuck on the hill and they couldn't communicate because the handphone out of battery and the satellite also don't beam in satellite communication for them. Huh? So I hope that those things I hope can be improved. So some of our observations here, the use of satellite data is moderately used and only at the planning stage. It is not used extensively. Although I am in the IGRSM, we promote highly the use of it. But in reality, that is not happening. Okay. Another thing that's not happening is the, the sharing of data. I, have been, I was involved in the early days from the National Land Data Bank, 19, uh, 1980s. That was the pioneer of what we call today the Malaysian uh, Geospatial uh, Pusat Data Hydro, uh, Geospatial Negara. And then they became knowledge, National Land Information Center, and then became MACD and so on. But you know what happened? I share with you my personal, honest opinion. We have developed highly sophisticated computerized systems. And each department or sections in the department have those systems internally for their use. Okay, another department developed very nicely internally for their use. But the situation no different from 30, 40 years ago. They don't communicate very much with the public, no with the universities. I repeat that. They don't communicate very much in sharing that data with the public, no with the universities. And one of my students actually did a PhD study, even within the same department, different division, even they don't communicate effectively. Now I ask you, 30, 40 years after the invent of the GIS, where have we progressed? The same mentality. People want to guard their data. They guard their data until it becomes obsolete. This is the value. This important point. They guard the data and your special data, you cannot keep good forever. It will become obsolete. It's a matter of time. It's not like gold. Huh? You keep gold for a long time. Your belly may go up, but not your special data. And where is the love for the society? Where is the love for the country? All of this data is collected using taxpayers' money. It belongs to the public. Why is it not being shared? We understand if you say it was military data, I understand. But for other data, where is the thinking? So this is, I hope, one of the issues to be addressed. How do you change the thinking? So we have to plan to minimize the risk that has potential, planning to minimize risk has great potential for improvement. And the limitation in use of satellite is during the actual disaster. In Malaysia, this is our experience. I have to tell you very bluntly. We have limitation at the moment. And drones offer an alternative. But don't be too uh, carried away by drones also. In the times of rains and storms and strong winds, we don't know how effective the drones really are. Okay? The drone operator also afraid his drone will crash. Yeah, so anyway, this experimental stage, we'll let you know next year how it goes on. So in conclusion, I'm looking forward to ideas like uh, what Sakai Sin said, just now said about the constellation. We can have 24 hours coverage. I'm very excited about this. I, <clears throat> if we can get, we don't have to have 24 satellites for Malaysia, but if ASEAN and Japan collaborate, each having two or three satellites, we can have the 24 satellites and they will uh, give us 24 hours coverage. And we look forward to interagency cooperation. I believe that is the way to go. I've been talking about it for the last 20 years. I will keep on talking about it. Yeah? It's not happening yet to our satisfaction, but it's the way to go. And there's always the issue of the developers' dollars, dollars, dollars versus public safety. We talk a lot about public safety, but those with the ideas to develop more dollars 
they just see the politicians. Politicians give the approval, give the direction to the civil servants. This is what's happening in most of the developing countries. But the power to change is within your hands. If the technical people say, no, this is nonsense. I'm not going to approve it. Maybe you get transferred. Huh? Maybe, maybe. But if your clique will replace you, also say no. I tell you, two or three no, the politician get transferred. The change has to come. It got to come from the people with the knowledge of the technology. And finally, we have to emphasize also and encourage apps. We have to create developments which sits in the hands of the users and they can appreciate this technology. So with that, I tell you, terima kasih. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, Professor Abdul Rashid, for your uh, passionate presentation. Um, I think indeed uh, this uh, information sharing issue, uh, if there is such a word, uh, information management governance or something, that's uh, I think always the problem, uh, sometimes even in Japan. And uh, I think another aspect of this uh, issue is uh, sometimes uh, we don't uh, use the data thinking uh, about the end user. Uh, so, you know, all the nice data, good data, uh, hazard maps is not uh, sometimes actually used, uh, utilized uh, by the people who really need uh, this kind of data. So thank you again, Professor. Uh, we proceed uh, to our um, third presenter, uh, Dr. Shweb Rambat of MJIT, my uh, colleague and friend who will present on uh, this study on seismic vulnerability assessment using different GIS hybrid models. So, um, Dr. Shri. Thank you very much, uh, Masura Sensei. Uh, so, it's very hot from uh, Prof. <laughs> Okay, Assalamualaikum, good afternoon and konnichiwa to all members of the floor. Uh, today, uh, I would like to share a research topic entitled Study on Seismic Vulnerability Assessment Using uh, Different GIS Hybrid Models. Okay, in this presentation, it consists of intellectual, natural, natural and mental result discussion and conclusion. Okay, as we know, Malaysia is a, especially uh, the West Malaysia is a safe uh, from any disaster. Uh, however, uh, uh, because, uh, sorry, uh, because uh, Malaysia is uh, considered not within the uh, Pacific uh, Ring of Fire. However, right now in Bukit Tinggi uh, incidents, uh, which had been hit by an earthquake with uh, 6.0 and 3.5 uh, magnitude, uh, Malaysia is no longer immune to seismic uh, disasters. Okay, uh, well, uh, what is a uh, seismic uh, disasters? So there is a uh, various of uh, definitions of uh, ven seismic vulnerability. Uh, for example, se uh, seismic vulnerability can be referred to inability of historical or monumental buildings to, stand, to withstand the effects of seismic force. Uh, other may say that uh, other may uh, define the seismic vulnerability as the pronounced uh, proneness buildings to manifest damage in occurrence of seismic events. Uh, it also can be defined as the susceptibility to damage by ground shaking of a given intensity. However, in this study, the definition uh, of vulnerability is as follows. The proneness of some categories of elements at risk to undergo adverse effects inflicted by potential earthquake as it act as operational tool for estimating the seismic risk, developments of earthquake scenarios, and the development of strategy of risk mitigation. So we're going to use this definition in our study. So uh, why the, uh, the need of this study is due to some reason. Okay, number one is the current method of seismic vulnerability assessment is mostly focused on assessing the physical damage to structures of the affected area. And number two is seismic vulnerability evaluation in high potential areas such as Tarnau district in Sabah is very important as there is a need of risk mitigation strategy. 
Okay, so the aim of this research study is to develop the fastest and rubber method for indicating the potentials of an earthquake areas. Okay, uh, specifically, the objective are to experience the hybrid model previously, previously used individually uh, for disasters related analysis. Uh, secondly, second objective is to validate the seismic vulnerability using uh, area under curve. And thirdly, to predict the seismic vulnerability. Okay, uh, this study used uh, satellite data, okay, uh, mainly the SRTM. Uh, instead of SRTM, we can also do use uh, JAXA also or ESTER, uh, digital elevation model. Okay, uh, the main purpose of using this R SRTM is to uh, generate or to derive the slope angles and the DEM. Uh, rather than the SRTM, you also need uh, optical uh, imagery, uh, which is, uh, in this case, I use uh, Landsat, where, whereby we also can use a Sentinel-2 or Sentinel-1. Okay, uh, the optical uh, data set uh, will be used to extract the land use and land cover, especially the physical uh, conditional cofactor. Okay, conditional factors. Uh, for example, uh, road, building, and track. Okay, uh, in this study, for the ancillary data, uh, for the location of earthquake, uh, we extract from IRIS, uh, Incorporated Research Institute for Seismology. Uh, while the lip uh, lithology map we uh, obtained from JMG, Department of Mineral and Geoscience Malaysia, uh, also has the fall maps. Okay, uh, when we have all us the, this data, uh, this data, we're going to uh, put it in a GIS application. Okay, so we store it in GIS application by using the GIS calculator. We use this uh, frequency ratio index of entropy, which is well established. Uh, this is the main one. Oh, sorry. This is the main one. Okay, this is the, the, the main one, uh, frequency ratio uh, index of entropy. And then uh, this data will combine with the AHP. This data will combine with LG, uh, LR, uh, logistic regression, and combined with uh, naive uh, bias. Okay, from this uh, combination of from these uh, manipulations, we, we can generate four types of images. Okay, the, four, the first one is uh, frequency ratio uh, index of entropy. And then this one is for frequency ratio index of entropy combined with the AHP. And this one is a combination of uh, frequency ratio index of entropy and uh, logistic regression. And then this one is a combination of RIOE with the NB. Okay, so uh, this is the result that we obtain. <laughs> okay, from uh, by using the AUC uh, area under the curve, Okay, we found that the AHP uh, is the best uh, solution, uh, best practice uh, to determine the uh, potentials of uh, uh, disaster. Okay, so uh, this is uh, approved by the uh, previous data. We validate with the previous data. Okay, this is the previous data. Okay, uh, I think uh, what we can say that uh, satellite uh, you, uh, satellite data able to escalate the process for seismic vulnerability assessment, especially area which has not been explored. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shweep, for your presentation. Um, our fourth presenter, last but not least, is um, Mr. Kentaro Kageyama and Asei Kaneko from Nippon Koei, Japan. Uh, and they will be presenting on uh, their business outlook using small SAR 
constellation satellite and business development using satellite data analysis technology. So uh, if you're ready, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Um, good evening, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's today's final presentation in this uh, kind of freezing room for me. And we are Nippon Koei, our international engineer consultants. And my name is, is Asei Kaneko from our Center for Satellite Intelligence Service in Nippon Koei. And our team's managers, Mr. Kageyama is also on the stage. Uh, today we are going to um, introduce our initiatives of uh, business development utilizing satellite data and an overview of small satellite constellation. And this is the today's contents. Um, so before going through the main topics of this, uh, uh, today's, uh, our presentation, uh, let me briefly talk about the, the overview of satellite remote sensing and the types of satellite were, uh, what, that we are using in our businesses or in even in uh, remote sensing. So uh, this is maybe too basic for some of you, but the definition of the satellite remote sensing is that uh, the method or processes to detect and monitor characteristics of the Earth's surface using satellite data. And among several types of satellite, the only Earth observation satellite can be used in uh, remote sensing. And that, that is the one we use in our businesses. And furthermore, the satellite, uh, Earth observation satellite can be classified into uh, some several um, types, I mean, uh, based on the sensor types, but we are focusing on, I mean, uh, we manage the data, uh, mainly optical satellite and satellite. For reference, um, the positioning satellite is used for, um, in a GNSS such as GPS, and also communication satellite is used in our internet communication. Okay, then I will explain the difference between optical satellite and satellite in next slide. So uh, optical satellite is almost like uh, aerial photos. So it has the information of color. So it, it, um, the optical satellite uh, observes the reflectance of sunlight and it is uh, used to analyze the information of color. Um, so the images, uh, as you see, it's easier to interpret or understand the situation happening in the image or the color of the object or shapes of the object. But uh, since this optical satellite is um, observing the reflectance of sunlight, the under the bad weather, for example, very cloudy weather or rainy weather, uh, this optical satellite doesn't work. Of course, uh, the nighttime observation is unavailable. An, uh, uh, On the other hand, SAR satellite is a radar satellite. And this satellite emits microwave itself by itself and reflect the, uh, the observe the reflectance uh, microwave. And the benefit of SAR satellite is that it can observe uh, the targets in any conditions, cause the mi cause the microwave penetrate clouds, so the star satellite can observe the Earth surface in uh, cloudy weather or rainy weather. Also, it can observe the Earth surface in uh, nighttime. But the as you see, the image is just black and white, so it's a bit uh, difficult to interpret uh, from uh, this just a star image. Um. <clears throat> So uh, this, in the field of remote sensing, we have uh, optical satellite and satellite. But uh, in recent years, small or micro uh, satellite has been developing remarkably. And um, the small, conventionally, satellite requires a lot of powers. So the satellite is huge. But uh, in these days, those are kind of small, SAR satellite uh, has been developing. And last year, uh, Nippon Koei uh, formed a business alliance with the Japanese um, 
startup company named IQPS, which has been developing uh, small cell satellite. And from here, uh, Mr. Kageyama will explain the details about a small satellite and a business plan of this IQPS. So now I will hand over to Mr. Kageyama. Hello, I am Kageyama from Nippon Kohen. I will explain the technical uh, overview of small satellite and introduce the technical features and the business scheme of QPS with which we have a business alliance and uh, capital, uh, capital tire. Uh, I will do my best uh, to promote by QPS. <laughs> uh, first of all, first of all uh, what, what is small satellite constellation? Uh, as shown in the figure uh, on the left, uh, it is a simultaneous operation of multiple uh, satellites with the same spec. And each satellite is much cheaper than larger satellites. Through this operation, we can uh, include the uh, spatial and temporal distancing uh, of uh, observation and response to various observation needs. Uh, a comparison of, comparison of the spec of the large satellite and the small satellite being produced by QPS is shown in the, on, the on the right. Uh, uh, larger satellites have higher uh, observation uh, capabilities, but small satellites have higher resolution and higher observation uh, frequency. Small satellite uh, consolation is a uh, consolation uh, and the commercialization uh, by various uh, companies around the world representative uh, companies of satellite uh, consolation as shown in the figure. Some companies have already moved operation phase and ISA is most advanced in the field of sa, uh, small star consolation. With the support of the government, Japanese companies have also moved operation phase. Uh, Currently working on various uh, demonstration tests. For reference, the status of optical satellite constellation is listed on the right. Next, here we are comparing the satellite uh, capabilities of four operators that are in the operational phase. Each has its own features, but the resolution differ, depend, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> depending on the antenna type. But, uh, but uh, capital space and QPS have attributed uh, resolution, resolution of one meter or less. ISI has completed about half of its planet satellite uh, deployment and has already launched various satellite uh, data studies, uh, analysis studies, uh, observation uh, intervals are uh, uh, much shorter than those large scale satellites. And we hope we will be able to acquire high resolution uh, data with high frequency near future. Next, I would like to introduce the QPS satellites and their business plan. QPS aims to deliver high resolution images to users in near real time, as described here. Image will be uh, delivered within 10 minutes at 10 minutes intervals. And image below 50 centimeters resolution 
will be performed by 36 satellites. QPS satellites look like this. The size of the umbrella, umbrella like parts is 3.6 meter, but they succeed with <coughs> in reducing the weight. Large and light antennas are the main sailing point QPS satellites. The QPS launches plan currently under review following the recent launch failure. But next year, they plan build two satellite constellations. The goal is to build constellation of 36 by the late 2020s. With 36 observation will be possible every 10 minutes. In this slide, uh, next. In this slide, I will explain the data communication technology of QPS. This is strong point. QPS believe that it is important to quickly deliver uh, data uh, to user. Uh, for, for that purpose, uh, they are developing an onboard image process processor and inter uh, satellite communication. By realizing this system, it is <coughs> be possible to deliver data within 10 minutes after the observation. Next, the vision scheme of QPS is shown in the figure. The scope of QPS business includes manufacturing satellites, launching them, operating them, and distributing data. Uh, then the data will be delivered to analysis companies such as uh, Nipokoe, and then delivered to end users as um, information service using satellite data. Now we are working together on a uh, demonstration project for commercialization. Next, so far, uh, I explained the overview of QPS satellite technology and their business plan. From here, I will show you uh, some sample images actually taken by uh, QPS uh, prototype satellites. This is um, taken in Osaka City uh, in Japan. You can see that uh, shape of road and each building can be uh, identified. Next, here's an image of Tokyo Marinochi and Tokyo Dome Stadium area taken in spotlight mode. The image is enough to distinguish the building. Since the roof of Tokyo Dome is made of crosses, the interior is visible through sun. This room, don't. They are image. Uh, next. They are image uh, taken with trip map mode. Also, it is a little blurry than a uh, spotlight mode. Facility, but facilities such as building can be read even in <coughs> urban areas. Now I will end my description of the small constellations here. Next, Mr. Kaneko will be explaining an analysis example using sat uh, satellite data. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kagema. From now, I will explain uh, uh, our initiatives of using uh, satellite remote sensing data. Uh, <clears throat> so in here, uh, I will introduce three solutions using satellite, uh, satellite data. So one is, uh, the first one is the utilization of satellite data during disaster. The second one is uh, uh, facility and infrastructure management. And third one is application of monitoring of vegetation and land alteration. 
The second one and third one are not uh, actually directed to uh, directly related to the kind of the disaster management. But um, please let me uh, introduce these as uh, application of uh, using SAR data. Uh, sorry, um, satellite data. So uh, in the utilization of uh, satellite data in disasters, um, the images taken after heavy rain or typhoon by satellite uh, can be used to extract the uh, inundation area or landslide areas. So um, the benefit of using this satellite image data instead of airplane or drone is that uh, a single uh, observation can cover a very huge areas. Um, actually, the resolution of the image of satellite is less than, uh, I mean, uh, less than uh, image of airplane or drones. Uh, that's the one of uh, the biggest benefit, the covering the wide areas. Also, <clears throat> it, uh, during the time of disaster, the uh, satellite can observe the areas that uh, is too dangerous for people to actually visit the site and check the situation. Also, by using SAR satellite, uh, it is able to uh, observe the, uh, the situation of the disaster at nighttime. And these examples are uh, the analysis results by satellite data uh, in, of uh, the flooding and landslide happened in 2021 and uh, last year in Malaysia. And this uh, results was obtained in collaboration of um, the National Research Institute of um, Earth uh, Science and um, Disaster uh, Prevention. Uh, resilience, sorry. <laughs> With um, Mr. Sakai. And, and uh, I will introduce um, the system that Nipponko is developing. Actually, um, it doesn't have to be our system, but I, I, I will say it is important to use those kind of system to provide uh, uh, analysis results and quickly and concisely to the users. Because uh, it is very important to provide those uh, the information of the disaster very quickly after right after the disaster happened. So, um, in the system, the good point of the system is that user doesn't ha don't have to install any software or hardware, but uh, they need just uh, it's just a web GIS system, so they can access um, from their PC or lap uh, tablet from anywhere. Okay, so um, this one is uh, the application for facility and infrastructure management. Um, I will not go into details about this technology, but the essence is that you can, uh, by using the SAR satellite, you can find um, the slight deformation or changes in uh, infrastructure facility. And what is the benefit of using this technology for the facility management? So um, there, oh, sorry. The figure below, in the figure below, the left side shows the kind of the management cycle based on um, conventional human inspections right here. And in this cycle, um, it is um, to inspect the a large facility is um, the hu human effort is very significant for that, that kind of uh, large facilities. But uh, if you put this interferometry SAR technology in this, in this cycle, um, the facility, manage facility managers can find a slight deformation before those facilities is going to under a serious situation. For example, collapse or uh, have some uh, significant uh, issues. So, um, but this figure is 
a little bit exaggerated because facility managers, of course, makes a lot of effort, for example, installing the sensors or camera on, this, on their facilities. So um, it's not simple like this in real. However, I would like to say um, the benefit of using this satellite uh, interferometry SAR is that uh, compared to just using a sensor or cameras, uh, this analysis data will give, uh, provide uh, the information of area or plane or surface, while the sensor just have the information of just points. But also I would like to mention that I'm not saying those IoT information is not required, but both is important. By combining IoT uh, data and this satellite uh, analysis data is important. And what we need to do is, uh, to understand the limit of the technology and understand what this technology can do and what this technology cannot do and combine them. Uh, it's just a time. So I will show the examples of uh, analysis results by interferometry sir of airport and mountain slopes and transmission tower. So in the results of airport, you will see the, the purple to blue area um, shows the substance in the airport. And as you see from uh, between survey results and SAR analysis results, there's not so uh, huge differences. So this area has settlement or substance. And this uh, satellite, data analysis can be also used in uh, vegetation management or like uh, to detect an uh, illegal um, urbanization or deforestation for, uh, as a monitoring. Then I just skip this slide. And uh, that includes my presentation today. And thank you for your attention. If you have any questions or need more information, please contact us here. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much um, for uh, actually waiting to uh, at the end of the day to present, make the presentation. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Kageyama and Mr. Kaneko. Um, I know that uh, we're kind of, uh, 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 the time is uh, supposedly supposed to be, uh, you know, the um, closing time, but uh, we do want to uh, proceed with the um, panel discussion. Um, because I think uh, we may have uh, several questions um, to our um, four presenters. So may I ask the uh, presenters to actually uh, come up to the stage uh, and, uh, yes. Yes, um, there's no seating arrangements. There's no protocol. You can sit wherever you want. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm going to be the facilitator for this panel discussion as well. And um, I know that the, some of you uh, wants to ask more about this uh, possibilities of the uh, satellite uh, technology and the, you know, what kind of products possibly could be uh, made from these uh, technologies. But for the sake of this uh, workshop that also um, kind of put lights on this um, government um, university industry partnership, I just want to ask uh, very quick questions to, for each one of you to answer, uh, which is uh, um, how can collaborations among government research institute and private companies uh, and even communities improve better utilization of remote sensing technology for disaster risk reduction rather than each of us or just some of us uh, working individually. Um, was my question okay, <laughs> clear? Okay, um, yes, so maybe uh, who wants to go first? <laughs> okay.
Hi. Uh, uh, thank you for your question. Now, um, I think in the, for using in satellite data information and uh, for private company and uh, so on, in the one point things, and uh, all stakeholder can share common image for um, disaster response situation. Uh, this is very important things. In Japan, the, in the data share is a very, very and, uh, important. Now, now, in the sectionary in the world, it's very, very hard. Now, now in the, we can um, get over the world in the, to using in a, a common image as a satellite data. So, I can share one experience. Uh, some years ago, I asked my undergraduates and postgraduate different classes uh, about similar question, how to get the cooperation and sharing with the government departments. I couldn't get uh, any good answer from the postgraduate student, but uh, one of the undergraduate students say, sir, why don't we go in the evening, we play football with the, uh, with the government department, and uh, why not in the evening, we drink the te tare, you know? drink tea and we eat the roti chanai. Roti chanai is the favorite food in Malaysia. So his thinking was that cultivate the friendship and the cooperation. And then after that, the sharing will flow through. I just shared experience. Uh, yes, uh, I totally agree with uh, Prof uh, because uh, if you uh, know somebody in that department, it much easier for you to uh, get a collaborate, uh, collaboration for, with them. Oh, thank you. And for my comment, I would say, um, for example, each government or like a research institute and private company has their own main roles or strengths. And for then politics should show their like uh, policy to use the survey remote sensing in society and research institutes should advance their remote sensing technology a lot. Then uh, private companies should expand the, the usage of remote sensing in uh, social implementation. So I think it's the balance is important and to, to communicate each other. Then if the, the te technology is advanced too much and that there's no users, that technology is not useful i think so the balance is more than i think so. uh, questions uh yes um uh, i'll uh, come to the questions um yeah uh yeah so you can ask your question please uh name yourself and okay your uh, my name is uh, smile from uh, civil defense okay i would like to ask so for the second presenter Okay, based on your presentation regarding the Sendai framework just now. Okay, uh, in my point of view, we only report the progress and activities to the Secretariat of Sendai framework at the international level. But to what extent the report can be felt or adopted and adapted by Malaysians regarding resilience uh, in the face of disaster around them? Thank you very much. If I can understand your question, see how well that Sundai framework can be adopted in Malaysia. I think we are a signatory to that agreement, to that framework. There's no issue of uh, adopting it. We already agreed to it. But uh, try to reflect. I, I show you just now uh, Bukit uh, Dinding residents. How would they feel about that uh, framework? We agreed internationally to the framework, but uh, they are they are plight. You know, their, their future is in the balance because such framework is not being adhered to. So whom do they complain to? Do they go to the United Nations? Because UN has adopted it, you know, and Malaysia also is a voting member over there, as you know. So it comes back to our leaders, those who represent the people. We have to honor what we have signed internationally. And I'm not talking uh, in isolation from Malaysia. I think the same situation applies to many other countries. Thank you very much, Prof. Oh, <laughs> yes, that's of course. Thank you for the question. For your mention, I was working with Amma before this, before I go back to my the idea. So basically, uh, we agreed that we have signed the agreement. 
And for your permission, all the data that we collected we already passed to the destination. In fact, uh, one of the conference that in the Mongolia, I think we are the best uh, data collection from Asia uh, so far. Malaysia, for example. Yeah. So uh, this means we comply all the regulation, we comply the permission, then we do the analysis. But the problem is time. Huh? But so far, compared to the Asia, we are the best so far uh, in, in terms of reporting this in different world. Thank you. Yes, I think. Uh... Oh, yes. Yes, Dr. Norida. I'm, I'm interested in the first presenter and the fourth presenter on the satellite image that can detect anything. Uh, what we found uh, actually uh, and currently that uh, it only detects the one on ground. All right. My question is, uh, does it any, uh, does it any uh, technology available from Japanese? that can help us in detecting the uh, sediment uh, uh, within the reservoir or in the dam itself. Because I saw there's a digital satellite images that can predict. If you could detect that, uh, please share us the information because we would like to learn about it. Thank you. Um, so your question is uh, if it's possible to find the sediment of the dam body itself. Okay. Um, I think it, it is possible to buy using uh, the infra in interferometry star technology because um, so interferometry star is um, comparing the phase difference of the wavelength. So it is able to um, detect the slight changes of dam body. I think it's a uh, which direction is the down body is facing, but um, I think theoretically it is, it is possible. Yeah, but um, if it's, it is important to, if the movement is just a sediment to vertical direction or a horizontal direction, maybe um, it is difficult to separate the, the movement of the direction, but we at least know that the dam is moving or not to rising or, <laughs> Substance, there's substance. Sediment. Sediment. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, Dr. Sonia, you have anything to add? No? Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, any other question? Hmm. Um, hmm. Um, I was uh, particularly interested about the, uh, the project that uh, I think uh, Niet and uh, Nippon Koe has been doing in Japan uh, of using the satellite uh, technology. Um, I'm just uh, wondering uh, what are the possibilities of, for example, applying the lessons and the experience from that project uh, to be applied to Malaysia? Mm. Thank you for your question. And now in Jera uh, in Malaysia, in the we can detect the uh, debris flow area in the in the um, the analysis for using uh, satellite data in the small satellite data in a planet. Then now we can work in together with uh, Nippon Koe. Uh, here. Then now in the now in the near future in the UTM. And the Bonkoe analysis in the we can provide we can manage the satellite data in the in the world for Malaysia near uh here's a route. So now in the near future in the we can work together for in the with the UTM and so on. Okay. Anything you want to add to uh, the possible application of that uh, SIP project that uh, Dr. Sakai? Um, yes, uh, as he said, uh, we can uh, cooperate to advance this uh, remote sensing technology and um, in Malaysia as well. Yeah, same same comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because and the SIP project is uh, finished this year. Now, now we can work in the uh, we can looking for a new work in the with the Malaysia in the program. Now we can work together for this today. 
Yeah, I can talk about this. Yeah, okay. I, yeah. Thank you. Um, well, yes, uh, I asked that question. Uh, ah, yes, Prof. Yeah, you have actually, we welcome such a cooperation. We're looking forward for this uh, consultation for a long time. We practically can work. I mean, I've been around five, six years now. We have been toying with these ideas. Uh, initially, we were thinking of working also together with our neighbors in Philippines who got Divita. But uh, it turns out that the individually owned satellite do not work so well because they have their national interests. Uh, they have their priority. But if we have a Nikon, uh, Nikon Kohei and other partners, I think, want to work together with IGRS, and we'd be very happy to introduce to our members and work together to make it a success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Well, uh, I asked that question half expecting that the you know, UTM and institutions like yourself could you know, um, be involved to uh, work, yep. yes, uh, for the uh, disaster risk reduction efforts uh, in Malaysia. And of course, uh, with our other uh, government agencies that's uh, responsible for landslide or debris flow or flooding. Um, yes, uh, time is running out. If you want to ask any last minute burning question, uh, yes, please, gentlemen in the back. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Shazwan from uh, National Water Research Institute of Malaysia. I have one question for, for Nippon Koi. I would like to know if Nippon Koi uh, have any experience in detecting the formation, tracking the movement, and predict the landfall of cumulonimbus cloud using satellite technology in Japan. Thank you. I'll, let me make sure the question at the last slide. Actually, detecting the uh, cumulonimbus formation for uh, flood cloud? forecasting, cloud cloud, cumulonimbus. <coughs> cloud? Yes. Uh, 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 awan, awan. Okay. Awan cumulonimbus. Wow. Mm. In our team, we have no such a, like our ex examples to observe the cloud, 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 a cloud, cloud, cloud. Okay. Cloud. Cloud. Actually, uh, the cumulonimbus is the cloud that uh, contribute uh, heavy rainfall. That's what I'm asking. Uh, Nippon Code, I think that it doesn't. Uh, we don't have such experience. I think. Okay. Uh, we're using just uh, our observation satellite to observe the our surface, but uh, looking at the cloud is um, okay. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, that's all. It's a good uh, presentation. Actually, on behalf of the ID, we are more involved in the, into a flood or drought. Actually, we are looking forward to have something like a collaboration with Nippon Kui in terms of using this as a satellite image now. Because we have problem with the uh, satellite image during the event, for example, because of the cloud. So maybe you can arrange one training or presentation in detail to us so that we have a further collaboration like, into how to use this satellite. We're looking forward. Maybe we can work together with your NGO uh, to uh, faster this process. Uh. Yeah? This is my comment. Thank you, Dato. Um, yeah, I think uh, actually NIAD does a lot of these kind of uh, uh, trainings. Um, uh, either experts like Dr. Sakai can come to Malaysia to do the training, or perhaps uh, the ID can come to Japan. Yeah. Ah, yes, yes, of course, of course, yes. Okay, um, I think we're running out of time. Uh, is it okay if we close? um the session um yes so uh thank you very much again for the presenters from session two i we really much appreciate we had i think a very good uh balance of uh kind of different perspective uh or you know um the the issue raised was a uh, very much uh, diverse i think uh uh in the in the discussions and in in the presentation so thank you very much again and uh yes we will end the session two now, uh, and then move on to the uh, closing session. So thank you again. Please give a round of applause to the presenters. So uh, 
in uh, closing, uh, I would like to present a very uh, well simple, uh, humble token of appreciation to uh, all the speakers uh, of this workshop. But uh, before that, I would like to again acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, Dato Engineer Sabri. Uh, thank you so much for taking your busy time to uh, spend time with us the whole afternoon. So uh, if you could come up to the stage, I want to. Yes, we would like to present. Um, For the gift ceremony, next, I would like to invite Dr. Hiroyuki, Hiroyuki Ishizaki from SIT Malaysia Satellite Office. Next, we would like to invite Engineer Dr. Norlida Mohamad Dom from DID Malaysia. Next, we would like to invite Ms. Livia Lahat from MJIT, UTM, and also from DID. Next, Ms. Siti Saima Abdurrahman from MJIT. Next, we would like to invite Dr. Shinsuke Matsuno from IHI Corporation Japan. And Dr. Ishizaki from SIT. Oh, okay. <laughs> Already. Already. Okay. Next, we would like to invite Dr. Naoki Sakai from NIED. Next, we would like to invite Professor Surveyor Jos Pasha Dr. Abdul Rashid Muhammad Sharif from President of IGRSM. Next, we would like to invite Surveyor Dr. Shui Brambat from MJIT UTMKL. And last but not least, Mr. Kentaro Kageyama. Yeah, one more. <laughs> and also Mr. Asai Kaneko from Nippon Koei. I would like to pass this ceremony back to Dr. Matsura. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so uh, we're going to finish now. And uh, I would like to thank again all the speakers and the organizations, facilitators, and the secretariat for this uh, successful workshop. And uh, we are actually uh, planning to um, follow up uh, with activities, maybe uh, you know another workshop. Um, uh, discussing about different uh, other uh, issues on disaster risk reduction. Again, inviting partners from government, industry, and academia uh, in the field, uh, So, which will be announced in the near future, hopefully. Uh, and I hope that you will join again uh, our workshops. And uh, I think more importantly, uh, start some kind of collaboration or partnership in uh, projects or what have you, uh, so that uh, we could actually um, implement some of these uh, activities in, in Malaysia as well. So with this said, uh, I would like to close uh, our workshop and I wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you very much.